God. <laughs> the winter of the Moran. I know. At least you got some warmth to ride in. Yeah, it's, it's nice cloudy. when the sun comes out. It's funny though, you you know, you you love this country, you love Canada, but you don't sign up for six month winters. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, give me four months. Four months is okay, you know. All right, brother. Sandy Nunziata, thank hey, you for coming in, brother. Hey, I, I brought something for you. Oh, oh so, so yeah, so obviously everyone's wearing jerseys today. Okay, uh, yeah. Recognition of the Humboldt tragedy. So this is what I'm going to be wearing at, at council today. And this All is right. my rookie Edmonton Eskimo jersey. I thought the, the colors were appropriate. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I thought, you know what? Maybe Jimmy wants to wear this for his his podcast <laughs> i need it back after the show but if you don't want it that's cool <laughs> no, too but I'm, I'm all right that's cool though the time. No Anyways, I appreciate it. yeah so but uh, all of council is going to be wearing jerseys and uh i should wear my eagles jersey I'm yeah you an eagles fan Are how happy were me? you man 30 how years happy i waited were you? around for that 30 like so, some odd years so yeah. one of my broadcast partners a good friend of mine mike hogan yeah oh, hoagie is a diehard eagle fan There's he's also the voice of the toronto argonauts and uh he I mean, it brought him to tears to finally, finally get that Super Bowl it for that was, city, uh, too. It's just great. It was yeah. cool. And, uh, McNabb couldn't pull it out. He puked at center field. And then <laughs> <laughs> it's funny what you remembered for as an athlete, right? You might oh, remember for all yeah. the touchdowns or the, the great athletic ability. You remember no. for that one moment when you threw yeah. up at, at midfield. Well, T.O.'s the out Bowl. there playing on a broken leg. And yeah. McNabb's puking from exhaustion or dehydration at midfield. Oh, and yeah. It's just not cool. For yeah. Me. All right, so let's get this rolling, and we'll share you up. All right, brother, I uh, appreciate you coming in. I know you got uh, a lot of things, and you oh, you got council tonight, man. That's yeah, that's going to be lots a of issues. Raucous event, probably. You think this is a lame duck council coming up so close to the election? Yeah, but, uh, you're going to probably deal with the HR issues this week. Well, the best that we can. Obviously, you know the, those HR issues um, are usually discussed in closed session, just mm -hmm. because they're HR. You're, you're bound by that confidentiality, so. Uh, but if there's anything we can discuss in the public, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So now, this is not my expertise field. I'm, I'm you know, a political addict, as you know, but uh, I had Tony Cork on. Yeah. And then uh, I had uh, Barrick on this week. Mm -hmm. I thought there was an issue with you sitting on a board and then, and then getting a job from the board, essentially. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah. And Tony comes in, and he's like, no, well, what are you talking about? It ha happens all the time. I'm like, dude, it says right when, when you take the board position that you can't benefit from this position mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form. So taking a leave from the board to apply for a CAO's position at the board, it seems like a pretty huge benefit to me if you're getting a job at a si sitting on the board. And then mm -hmm. some people said, well, hey, sometimes the board member knows best about what's going on at you know, as a, yeah. you know, for the director's pos position, the CAO, CAO position, but... So here we have, uh, you know, um, Carmen and Dave both kind of in similar situations. Carm stepped back, and then did he take did he take a job for the terms of reference of the position he applied for? Then got mm -hmm. the job for the CEO of the NPCA. Then hardly a lateral move over to the to the regionist. That's a damn good job, and yeah. you know, I, you know, I. I I have a tendency to hate on people when I think that they're unfairly got positions. I think that there's maybe maybe a smaller minority than I think is out there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and, and I've come around on Dave only because he's really stood firm. I think yeah. he's articulate. He's uh, well-read. He, he does his homework. And, but he's stood against integrity issue stuff, against, uh, uh, you know, some of these reports that come before, um, dual direct, you mm -hmm. know, all these kind of things, like for the important issues that he stood – where my opinion, where I would stand, and where my opinion would be. So, I, I just wonder what your take is on the the image. Yeah. It, it looks it looks bad, and even though it might be allowed, I, I think yeah. I mean, we've got a serious PR issue. We've got a serious PR issue both at the NPCA and in the region. And we can talk about that. But, mm -hmm. but what's your take on you know sitting on a board, taking a leave? And then getting hired by the company that you sit on. Yeah. Well, just to back up a little bit. So you made a point about, you know, important issues. But I think that that is discretionary, right? There's subjectivity to what's important to you mm -hmm. as a citizen as opposed to what's important to media. another citizen or the media. Exactly. Uh, so when you talk about integrity commissioner complaints and, uh, uh, and some of those other issues, yeah, that, that may be important to a lot of people. But there's other issues that the region deals with on a regular basis that um, are more important. Mm -hmm. So I think when you look at the makeup of regional council, if you look at the makeup of any board, there's certain skill sets.
that everyone brings forward. And I think uh, depending on what those skill sets are, there is opportunity to capitalize on uh, your skill, your acumen, uh, whether it was in the private sector, whether now it's in the public sector, and to apply those skills in, um, in, uh, in, in the corporate structure. I mean, how do I feel about it? I don't think you should be discluded or discounted uh, simply because you've made the commitment to bring a skill set to a board or committee. Uh, and on top of that, you, you, you do have experience and you, you have assets and a skill set that mm -hmm. uh, may be valuable or inside valued knowledge. by the organization, insider knowledge, whatever it is. So you also I, I got friends on the hiring committee and friends on the board that are going to put you in that position that may, you might not even be qualified for. You may not be, exactly. But I, I, so I, I wouldn't necessarily attack the individual or criticize the individual for wanting um, uh, to, to, to make a career move like that, especially mm. if they're qualified. But I think that qualification process, uh, I think when you talk about the rigor that goes into a job interview or goes into the terms of reference or goes into... Um, uh, you know, uh, the selection uh, of um, of candidates, I think that has to be foolproof. Mm -hmm. And as long as that's foolproof, I think people should have confidence that you got the best person for the job. But to your point, absolutely, if there's cronyism, if there's nepotism, if there's any of those things, then uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bring confidence uh, to the process. And by virtue of the candidate getting a job uh, in, 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 in that environment, in those circumstances, um, then he's open up to criticism and certainly, um, you know, some of that, that harsh commentary. Yeah. Now we see this all over the place. You've been around enough to know, you've been around enough municipal councils to know that, man, it's not uncommon for someone's daughter, someone's cousin, someone, yeah. man, this happens everywhere. And mm -hmm. you almost can't stop it because I think it's human nature to cash in. A, and I think we sit back yeah. here and we're bitter because we want a little taste. <laughs> we want our piece of sugar. Sure. Right? And so, yeah. We're frustrated, hating on the guys that seem to be accepting privilege. Sorry for the term. I know yeah, it's a dirty term yeah. now, privilege. But um, how can how can we restore? Is there any way to restore? And, you know, I talked to Dave Barrick about, let's just rip the region apart. Let's make it a service provider. Well, good luck getting that to happen yeah. unless, the, unless the province mandates it down. Mm. But, like, how do we get from out from underneath this feeling like ah, it's all who you know when you get a job at the city or yeah. you get a job on a board or an organization it's all about who you know yeah and that's that that attitude seems to be pervasive um but again i think part of your job as elected officials is to manage those expectations and when those commentaries come up i think it's incumbent upon you to maybe set the record straight or um uh, you know talk about uh, the skill sets of, of some of the hires that you've made so yeah, I'm sure there's circumstances that exist all over the province, and it's it's not uncommon. There's a you know historical references you can you, you can uh, uh, look to that uh, who knows who, and um, you know this person got this job, this person goes. That. I mean, connect the dots. I mean, six degrees of yeah. separation is a is a, is a pretty wide berth, right? So yeah. um, I don't know. All I can do, all I can say is when you look at some of the hires that the region has made, uh, that the MPCA has made, they've been great hires. Uh, there's a skill set and a knowledge there that has brought positive difference uh, to these organizations. So on the one hand, you can condemn the process about, well, they sat on a board and now they get jobs there. They've been great. Uh, if you're looking at uh, Carmen D'Angelo or looking at David Barrick, those are very two accomplished individuals that bring an incredible amount of, uh, uh, of skill to the, to, to, to the, um, to the positions that they hold right now. And, um, I can say that because I've worked with David in, in both uh, uh, a professional capacity as a fellow colleague on regional council, and I've worked with him at the MPCA, mm. and uh, he is he does a great job there. He really does. And, and a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of the times, um, a lot of the criticism is unwarranted, right? Because all they want to focus on is, well, he got a job there, mm. um, and who did he know to get that job? But no one really looks at the value that he brings, and he does that's bring a, a lot of question, value. question, though, and I appreciate your response as far as, well, you got to talk about the people you hired, but that's what we're doing, and we don't know who competed against Dave Barrick's job or if there was anyone. Uh, and But now, the, the, especially with this leak, and we can talk about that as much as you can, mm -hmm. uh, for Carmen D'Angelo, this... Like now we know there's some qualified guys out there, some former CEOs of big yeah. corporations that didn't get the job. And then we look to Carmen and go, well, what experience did you have that mm. made you a better candidate? And Selena Volpatti kind of blew me away in the last show last year that we did. 
She said, wow, I wasn't on the hiring committee. And Senzik said the same thing. But yeah. now he's calling for an inquiry. I wasn't on the hiring yeah. committee. I trust these guys to get it right and bring it to me, yeah. and I vote the way they vote. Well, come on. You can't have it both ways. Yeah. And then, and then, so he votes for him, and now he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We didn't. Come on. You didn't know. Yeah. So when you look at that whole process, uh, there's a lot of rigor in that process, right? So you want to make sure that you on get the committee level, on the com- at the committee level um, and you have the, the independent consultant coming in to lend their advice and their support as well. And then through a very democratic process, uh, you know, he's confirmed by an overwhelming majority uh, of regional council. So uh, if there's... If there's flaws in the process, um, then, you know, absolutely. That's something that maybe we should look at internally and mm-hmm. make sure that uh, everything, uh, um, you know, was above board. And, and uh, Yeah, but do we really, can we trust in an internal audit or internal investigation now? Does it need to be somebody, a third think, party from outside? Oh, I think that depends on your level of skepticism, right? Uh, well, we're all really I mean, that's skeptical. The problem. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I we've mean, gone down this yeah. road so far now, yeah. especially with the NPCA. I don't think we trust... Well, Politics I, or, or yeah. boards or associations anymore. Yeah. Like, period. No, and that's, that's you know, that's, um, I think that's appropriate. I think there has to be a healthy level of skepticism when it comes to any level of government. Any mm-hmm. level of government. And I always said this too. Any level, uh, organization, public organization, any uh, government agency that is the recipient of public tax dollars mm-hmm. should not be removed uh, from any scrutiny. Uh, so I welcome that scrutiny. Uh, shine the light. And if there's, Things that are uncovered, uh, that have been done poorly, let's fix them. Let's do things right and uh, get back to uh, governing in a very responsible and open, transparent way. I've always said that, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, just because uh, you don't want negative media and negative press, that does not alleviate uh, the scrutiny that you should be put under as an elected official. I think every elected official, every public agency that receives public dollars should be put under that same level of scrutiny. Yeah. I guess uh, most of us are, are, well, not most of us. I think there's a huge question out there. Like, what are you guys doing up there? Like, really, what are you getting done? Can you point to something, and I don't want to hear GO or GE yeah. because, you know, come on. Um, obviously, we're lobbying for things like that. And Sure. Did, did the GE guy really have connections in Niagara? Is that what brought him here, or was it the work that the region did? But aside of those two things, yeah. rhetorical question, yeah. I appreciate you uh you know what have we got done for the taxpayers that can say yeah my guy and then we can talk about what you personally are proud of for your region yeah uh, what do you think the region's got done as a whole well again i think uh, when you put your uh, strategic plan in place at the beginning of term and you say okay what's important what's important to the residents of niagara and it's tough Money. because, yeah, because it's a balancing act because what's important in Fort Erie may not be important in Thorold or may not be important well, when in Wayne Place. We all want more taxes. Place. Exactly. So, that was, line, so you know, that the cream rises to the top as far as those priorities. And the first thing um, that we could all reach consensus on was, and, th- you know, it may sound like a soundbite because we've heard it so often over the last decade. You created soundbites. Life <laughs> has become very unaffordable for regular folks in Ontario. Um, so when you Outside talk about of the responsibilities of the region, exactly. Has. So I, I mean, just because you pay regional tax, that doesn't mean that the cost of gasoline has gone up, the cost of groceries have gone up, hydro, uh, the cost of hydro has gone up, and then these are things outside of the control of regional government. So we have to do our part to say, okay, we understand that there's a burden and there's a financial hardship on a lot of families right now. What can we do at our level of government? that can help alleviate some of those pains. And the first thing was, let's keep taxes low. Uh, Let's try to do our best to make sure that services um, are, uh, um, you know, not cut, Uh, that the level of service uh, reaches the expectation that the average homeowner deserves. Uh, So that was the first thing. And make sure that it comes with uh, um, a very responsible taxation level. And if you look at the average taxation over the last four years, I think it's 1.47%. Uh, which is below the cost of inflation. So I think we've done a great job on those terms. And then you got the negative naysayers that say, oh, yeah, but you have to cut this and cut that. And cut. No, we've actually enhanced services. We look for those efficiencies. We have internal audits now. Uh, we make sure we're doing everything that we can to be open, transparent, and um, respecting taxpayer dollars. So I think that's the first priority we've done. Now, what else can you do as far as growing the economy, growing um the region, um, inuring the environment, uh, creating a path of of least resistance when it comes to job creation, economic growth, uh, all these things. 
And, and, and we've done that uh, by partnering with our provincial and federal partners the best that we can, recognizing the uniqueness of Niagara and trying to capitalize on those strengths. Uh, we had this great uh, grand opening a couple of days ago, the, uh, the first ever in Ontario uh, foreign uh, uh, trade zone. And um, what it does is it, it puts another tool in the toolbox uh, for job creation and this industrial uh, renaissance that hopefully uh, we're, we're going through in Niagara right now. So, yeah, we can do a lot of things at our level of government, but we need help, obviously, because the pressures from the province and the, and, and the federal government, they're, they're pushing down on families. It's really difficult. Yeah. Now, switching gears a little bit, we can go back and forth yeah, from no the regional to MPCA. I, you know, I appreciate your, your thoughts on transparency and accountability, but... Mm -hmm. Um, and where's the where does the MPCA get off suing a private individual? You guys should know better than that. You can't you, you can't. I mean, that's just not done. You can't yeah. sue an individual. I think Judge Ramsey put it in his decision. You know, uh, a government can't sue someone for criticizing them. So what resulted there? Is that a misstep on your part? Um, I wouldn't say it's a misstep. I wouldn't say it's a misstep. And uh, I, I know we've we've uh, uh, we've gotten criticized over that one. Um, but uh, well, it cost you two fifty k, right? So we yeah. have to pay for it over two hundred fifty k. Yeah. Um, listen, we 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 respect Judge Ramsey's ruling. Uh, we think he colored a little outside the lines in some of his commentary. But having said that, um, the judgment came down that you're right. Uh, you you cannot uh, sue a private citizen because we're a public uh, agency, and um, you shouldn't be able to sue. Um, someone from the, the, the general public that criticizes you. But from my perspective, and certainly the board's perspective, and this was a board decision, um, Ed Smith was not sued uh, for asking questions or criticizing. That is, that is a narrative that uh, is just demonstrably false. Uh, he was sued uh, for libelous statements. He was sued for uh, making um, uh, um, allegations and misrepresenting the truth about Carmen D'Angelo and about the NPCA. And we asked him to correct the record on three different occasions. And this is uh, without being litigious, without it ever getting to court. We asked him on three separate occasions to correct the record on three specific issues, and he refused to do so. Um, and at that point, uh, it's a board decision uh, to make sure that that record is corrected. Uh, if anything came out of that Ramsey decision, it was that the record was corrected on those three issues. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the the backlash and the negative criticism that went for it was, well, you had to sue a public uh, uh, member uh, of, of of the community in order to get that correction. And uh, that's the decision the board made, and I stand by that decision. Um, given the same circumstances over and over again, I don't know. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough call because you value your employees, and... Uh, if someone is saying things um, demonstrably false and, uh, and, and, and that may impact a person's career and their livelihood and their reputation, I would think uh, a conscientious employer would certainly go to bat and defend that employee uh, and do everything they can to make sure that the record gets corrected. Um, so, I mean, that's where that situation is. And again, hey... We're open to criticism, mm -hmm. and uh, we learn from it, and we move on, and uh, that's where we're at right now. What do you? Um, what gave uh, rise to the change in mandate for the MPCA? See, and that's a great or, question, Jim. And you know, uh, this is the concern I have. And we're going through a strategic you know, my planning session is, uh, right just now. Just to be clear, so everyone knows what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, the 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 word out there is that you've gone from a conservation authority that you know is yeah. strictly supposed to conserve wetlands and things like that to uh, kind of a into a pro development strategy a pro business yeah strategy. And, and again it's a narrative that's not true um it's a narrative that uh, keeps getting pushed out there but so we're going through a strategic planning session right now we just finished our, our 2014 to 2017 strat plan and uh, we corrected a lot of the deficiencies from 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 the previous uh, uh edition of the npca and that was an organization in crisis i mean um you know, we, we had an the former board, the former, well, not, not just in the former board, but the former organization, there was no rigor to anything. There was no HR policy. There was no procurement policy. There was no, um, there was no processes, uh, best from a best business perspective. You're talking about millions of dollars and, uh, you know, there was no proper accounting system. Things were written on a piece of paper. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. 
Uh, and uh, now we're a very competently managed organization. We have those processes in place. There's a lot of rigor. There's a lot of lot more uh, transparency, a lot more accountability into the systems that we put in place. Um, and what happened was that change uh, caused a lot of angst. It caused a lot of angst uh, with our community partners. And um, the narrative that came out of that was somehow, um, you know, we were pro-development. And I will say this, the pendulum always swings. Uh, and when you look at the two sides of that pendulum, you have environmentalists on one side of that pendulum, and you say you have development and, uh, um, uh, you know, um, you know, home builders and, uh, you know, that, business, that, that the business people on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, the pendulum, as far as I'm concerned, should never swing outside of the mandate, which is the Conservation Authorities Act. And it's funny, we went through this uh, exercise uh, a few months ago, just about the visioning exercise, about getting ready for public engagement and just to see what other people's priorities are when it comes to the uh, MPCA. And we're going through that, that, that uh, very robust public consultation right now to get feedback. And we were stuck on that issue, that mandate, right? And, and around the table, for the most part, it was pretty easy. Well, our mandate is the Conservation Authorities Act. And it's funny, you start investigating uh, all the conservation authorities throughout Ontario, and there's 36 conservation authorities, and everyone had a different mandate. And I thought to myself, why? Every conservation authority in Ontario should have the exact same mandate, and the mandate should be the Conservation Authorities Act. I mean, if you want to break it down as far as the uniqueness of your area in your region, then you can kind of capture that probably in your mission and in your vision statements, mm -hmm. but the mandate... The mandate is the Conservation Authorities Act, plain and simple. And sometimes, you know, we don't do ourselves any favors by trying to get cute, you know, with the mission. Um, and our conservation partners trying to get cute with the mission uh, uh, and mandate statements. Mandate is mandate. It's the Conservation Authorities Act. And we will stay in the lines and we will value that document and we will always respect that document. You talk about narratives, and I can only assume that you mean that these things are coming from the media. I mean, we have to get our information from somewhere. Yeah. Certainly, uh, the average citizen doesn't call you and say, hey, what's up with that? Mm -hmm. What's up with, you know, I don't know, 80 firings or what, you know what, the turnover, the high turnover. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about your relationship with the media, both personally, from the board position. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Chair Castlin's office has been a freaking nightmare. Like, I mean, it's just been... We've handled so many things badly. Bill Sawchuk. I mean, yeah. it seems like every time you guys dance with the media, it's <laughs> them taking a slant that is basically, we want these guys gone. Like, it really sounds like when I, and I read very little yeah. of of the local media, yeah. uh, I just I just find it heavily biased. And I can... I can I can see the hate in the words that are coming out of it. Yeah. You know, I yeah. I at least will acknowledge I'm trying to deal with mine. Yeah. I think most people yeah. won't, but yeah. you know. No, you you make good points. There's and, a lot of yeah. vitriol there and a lot of bitterness, and I feel like some of these guys actually think that they can take you down and have you replaced. Yeah, and, I, you know, I, I have no fear that that Barrick's going to get reelected if he decides to run. Yeah, I have no fear that even you, as the chair. They're taking lots of arrows at the MPCA. You win again in Fort Erie, man, if you decide to run. It's like there's not, for the amount of people that are pissed off, yeah. not enough in your riding to take you out. Yeah. I don't well, think. Well, and like I said, I sleep very good at night, Jimmy. When, when, when I look at, you know, what we've done at the NPCA, you know, we, 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 we respect all the voices that, that that piece of legislation touches, whether it's the agricultural community, whether it's farmers, whether it's conservationists, whether it's the building community, whether it's municipal councils, right? So we have to listen to all those voices, and I, I'm very comfortable that we're, we're, we're meeting our obligations within the mandate. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because there's a lot of people out there, a lot of voices that want us to be something that we're not. And when we're not what they want us to be, that's when they point the finger and say, well, you're not meeting your mandate. And I'm saying, well, that's not true because we have to do a better job of educating people what our mandate is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I don't and I don't, I don't blame them because they just don't know what our mandate is, so they can't speak to it. So obviously they think, well, you're not following your mandate. Well, if you think we're something that we're not, then yeah, we're not following our mandate. Um, but to your point, I'm I've been uh, intimately involved in the media for a long time through a professional football career where I was constantly being 
uh, critiqued and criticized, uh, where I was being held up as a, as a hero. Uh, so the pendulum always swings, right, from goat uh, to greatness, so to speak. So I'm, I'm used to the slings and arrows of public criticism. Uh, and everyone used to say this, Sandy, you know, it's kind of like you go from being a professional athlete into politics. That's kind of strange. And I said, no, it's not, because I'll tell you why. Um, they both have their inherent dangers. Um, at least in football, the enemy always came at me from the front. And they were dressed in another Exactly. Uh, but in jersey. politics, they tend to sneak up on you, right? Um, <laughs> so the media is just part of that. Uh, they have a job to do, and their job is to report the news. Uh, I think the problems arise no, their when... Their job is when, to... Their, their job should be to report re- the news. Absolutely. Their, their the, mandate is to sell papers. Yeah, and that's the problem, right? When they're going I broke, know. you feel like these guys are on a make work project i swear you know i'm not i want to paint them all with the same brush but some of these guys will write story after story after story and beat something to death even with a partially false narrative you know how a a good lie starts with a little bit of truth i heard this great uh this great analogy and uh it's the uh the arsonist fireman you know Mm -hmm. um and uh, uh, sometimes journalism is difficult. It's I, and I and I fully admit that sometimes good Especially journalism when is nothing's difficult. Nothing's going on. You got to manage. Yeah. Well, you got to stay disciplined. You got to stay disciplined. You have to be, stay true to your craft. And uh, journalism, I have a lot of respect for journalists. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time for storytellers. A, it, do you it, want to name any specifically? I do not want to name I'm anyone glad specifically. You up fire and arson, though, and I'm going to switch gears. We'll get you right out of that hole. That yeah, I no worries. Um, emergency services. Yeah. When and how are we ever able to say, wait a second, guys, we can't afford this? In St. Catharines, it's over 60% of the operating budget. Yeah. I Again, I'm no professional in this field, but when I look at that and go fire, emergency services, policing, They've got us over a barrel. Oh, mm. Okay, so what services do you want us to cut? Oh, you want us to hold the line on taxes yeah. or on our budgets? Then what do you want us to, to claw back? Well, you want your you, you know you want to be safe, or you you want to pay your taxes? Yeah, you can't have it both. You got to pay, or you or you're gonna lose safety, and that's yeah. I mean, I don't know. We can talk about I you know I'm not sure that there's a better way to police. You know, I'm not suggesting we call in the OPP and they mm. can do it cheaper. No. Uh, I, I like having our own regional force, but then there's a whole bunch of problems, a whole th- a whole string of things we could do differently and yeah. better and cheaper. We got unions to deal with. That doesn't make it so easy. But at one point, at what point are we okay to say, "Wait a second, no tanks, yeah. no no raises"? So yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, well, what's the I, answer I, for something like it's that? funny because uh, I think uh, a lot of times. Um, in order to push a, a specific position or uh, a specific agenda from one side uh, over the other side, there's a lot of fear mongering that goes into, um, uh, you know, emergency services, uh, first responders, because a lot of times they're dealing with life and death situations. Mm-hmm. Um, and our first responders do an amazing job. Uh, and I know even in my community, we have a volunteer fire department and they do, an, do. an incredible job, an incredible job. Um, you know, there's this great issue going on right now. It's two hatters, right? Uh, where where there uh, there's a fire uh, man or woman in, on a uh, on a fire on a being a fireman for full time, and they're volunteering their time in their home municipality or their home community, and the unions are coming down on them like you wouldn't believe. Well, this is what I'm hearing. You yeah. know, the fire the firefighters are actually training it for first responders now because. Well, because there's no fires. Yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, and these are the guys. I'm not running in any burning buildings. I yeah. can't even imagine doing that. I know. You know, to save my own family. Yeah. Forget doing it as a career. Put my life on the line. So, absolutely, I got a ton of respect for them. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, th- I think if you, you know, the, the budget should be, should be finite. The budget should not be infinite. It should be finite. And within that budget pie... You have to determine where your resources and where your assets are going to be going. And I know a lot of those assets, a lot of those resources over the last little while have been going towards proactive uh, um, uh, proactive uh, uh, measurements, whether it's education in schools, whether it's making sure that fire alarms and fire detectors uh, are in every home. And what that does is it, it reduces the reactive cost. Uh, and the same thing in healthcare as well, right? Like if we invest a whole lot more on the front end and proactive, 
then it'll save us money in, in reactive. Uh, so I, I see that that pendulum has to swing towards being more proactive rather than reactive. And I think uh, there's some cost savings to be realized there. Uh, they never but, come down the pipe, though. I know. And that's the problem, right? Because I think uh, politicians have to be brave uh, and they have to understand, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the fiscal pressures on people right now. Um, but um, it's, 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 a tough, it's a tough thing to say no to your first responders. It's a tough thing to say no to policing. It's a tough thing to say no uh, to fire services, right? I mean, these are valued members of our community because they do such an incredible the job. Municipalities go bankrupt. Yeah, well, absolutely. Mean, some yeah. small municipalities are facing bankruptcy because of their emergency services yeah. budgets. I mean, yeah. well, what happens then? We get to merge with bigger. St- I just. I know. I don't have the, the answer. I'm, I'm, I was yeah. hoping that you would have, you know, some idea. I mean, you, you, we're not going to suggest volunteer firefighters for every community, yeah. especially for the size of I don't know St. Catharines. Maybe for the smaller ones, it mm-hmm. works. But I don't know. Maybe there's a hybrid plan, or I, I mean, with most of these emergency services, I think. Um, Labor wages are, are, are the biggest budget. I think that's the item, biggest budget right? item right there. Yeah, because it, you're not you're not uh, you're not selling a service. You're selling uh, a, a, you know a, a crew or a staff of people that actually implement uh, those important services. So, yeah, labor uh, is probably the biggest the biggest cost when it comes to emergency services. And there's what are you saying there's nothing really we can do about that because labor is negotiated through arbitration and we've got, you need so many bodies on hand or. Well, it all depends who you ask, right? So I know, uh, uh, yeah, it, yeah. I, but you need you need you need partnerships, especially at the province. You need brave politicians at the provincial level uh, in order to fix a broken arbitration system. Um, you have uh, collective, collect, collective, we collective, collective. Bar- yeah, I know a utopia, but that's yeah. that's not. Yeah, it's just not happening. Brother, it, uh, talk to me a little bit about how much confidence have you got in the chair's office? I know you, you're traditionally a conservative, right? Um, so that's a great, that's a great Barrett point. Barrett came out and surprised me. Yeah. Saying, hey, I was on the, I was on the board of the liberal you know, association. I'm, 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 I'm not <laughs> a, I'm, I'm not an ideologue. I'm not, uh, I'm not so partisan that, uh, I don't recognize good ideas no matter where they come from on the political spectrum. I think being in this, so you're not a block, a block <sighs> voter, you know, no, you don't vote no, 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 not at all. Not at all. I mean, if you look at my voting vote. record, um, I vote. I've seen the voting record out there, and there's yeah. certain guys that bring uh, motions forward, and yeah. they get no support from yeah. the all the regular guys based on who brought it forward. It, Jimmy, I take my mandate from the people that put me there, which is the citizens of Fort Erie. So if it's good for Fort Erie, uh, uh, that's my first concern. Uh, is it good for Fort Erie? Shouldn't it be? Shouldn't and then my it be second the concern. Region, then my second concern is: is it good for the region? Because I'm well, from, when you're elected and you sign that oath. It's got nothing about Fort Erie in there. It says you you need to act for what's best for the people of the region. But the two are not mutually exclusive. So when when there's a very Fort Erie centric issue coming to regional council, mm-hmm. um, colleagues have been very supportive. My colleagues have been so supportive when it comes to Fort Erie finally getting uh, uh, you know what it's deserved um, uh, for so many years. So I, I I cannot criticize my colleagues at all when it comes to recognizing the needs of Fort Erie and supporting me uh, whenever there's a Fort Erie-centric issue on the table. You know, there's a great example here. I remember we were going through the budget cycle and uh, there was an issue on the uh, uh, Thorold Ferry and it was a $70,000 budget issue. And you know, my Paul good, Robinson. Yeah, Paul Robinson Ferry, exactly. And uh, my good friend uh, Mayor so Tad take a car across. <laughs> well, Mayor Tad comes forward. He says, "You know, this is something that is important to my community." And we talk about transportation. Transportation comes all kinds of different ways. Whether it's airports, whether it's no highway corridors in Port Robinson, except the ferry. The ferry. So it's a seven seventy thousand dollar budget item. And I voted. I said, "Absolutely, I'm going to support my friends in uh, in Thorold. I'm going to support Mayor Ted. He's always been very supportive of Fort Erie." And I remember, I used to get a call. I was getting calls. Why would you? What, what does that have to do with Fort Erie? What is that? What does a ferry in Port Robbins have to do with Fort Erie? And I said, "Listen. I said the high tide rises all boats. And if it's good for Thorold, if it's good for Mayor Ted, then you know what? It's going to be good for Fort Erie because you're talking about transportation links. You're talking about transit. It doesn't matter if it's." Uh, uh, walkable communities. It doesn't matter if it's the GO train. It doesn't matter if it's uh, a regional airport. Transportation is transportation. Um, and if they need the ferry there to provide that connectivity, then absolutely I'm going to fully support it. So I think that's the attitude that I've always brought to regional council. Uh, to, to your uh, original question, 
um, yeah, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, uh, you know, there, there was a DC issue that came forward and uh, there was two options given. And one uh, would impact the Fort Erie uh, mill rate by this amount. And the second option would impact the Fort Erie mill rate by a little bit more. And uh, my host municipality, Fort Erie, had a concern. So they convey that to me and absolutely I'm going to support my colleagues and I'm going to support the planning department that that has to deal with that impact and if you look at the voting record I certainly voted against um, that particular option with respect to that that uh, uh, that that tax um, mill rate that was being proposed so yeah there are times when uh, I do get a little parochial but it's it's those issues that will impact my residents more so than say investing in uh, a regional airport, which I'm fully supportive, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, chair's office, what, what grade are you giving? You know uh, what, I, I, I am a big fan of, uh, of Al, and um, he's always been there for Fort Erie. He's so always been there for Fort Erie. grade, then where would you put him? For Fort Erie specifically, I'm giving no, just, him. I'm just all over regional chair. Well, considering uh, the, the many voices and the many personalities and the 12 municipalities he has to juggle, uh, I think he's doing a pretty good job. And you can't be everything to everybody, and you can't please everyone all the time. Uh, so, yeah, there's always going to be someone that has a problem with a decision he makes or, no, or something he says. So, so much at most of the decisions because he's only sometimes not even a vote. Yeah. But leadership on and off the field. I mean, um, he struggled in that department. He could have taken this integrity issue on. He didn't have to. He could have said, you know what? Yeah. I'll deal with the integrity complaints. Mm -hmm. And maybe you find that that's subject to a little bit of human error or favoritism yeah. or what have you. But the, this whole discussion about code of conduct, integrity issues, complaints, it, it, commissioners, the money we spent and the time. Dude, I watched yeah. these freaking meetings. It goes back yeah. to your original point, though, Jim, when you said, uh, you know, it's important to me. And that particular issue you're absolutely right. It may be important to uh, a certain segment of the demographic. A segment that want to use it as a political tool, yeah. it seems to me. Yeah, it seems that way, exactly. A lot of times it does. I can't believe yeah. that the Code of Conduct doesn't respect the Charter anywhere in Ontario. Yeah. Um, I thought Andy was onto something when he took that on. I thought, well, good. If you win this, we'll get a, we'll get a code that works for everyone. Yeah. You know, yeah. be, you know, and this idea about being on the clock or never off the clock. I know. That's... If I tell an off-color joke on a boat up in a lake with with you yeah and i know you know a constituent happens to be with it, like seriously they're gonna file like an integrity complaint now if you're leaking confidential data which is happening yeah and i understand there's another integrity complaint yep. coming down the the pipe on on someone leaking yeah you know um in camera session information yeah. dude you can't you have to respect that one. Oh, absolutely no but no there's guys all over i asked barrick if he ever ever leaked anything I don't think he answered it. Have you ever leaked something? I've never the, leaked anything. I mean, if it's for the confidential, sake of the, the electorate that you just film, you know what? People need to know this. It needs to get out there to the media. No, because I respect the oath that I took. I respect uh, the decorum of being uh, an elected official. Um, I mean, yeah. I can I see this thing. I can make my argument if it's something that we're going in closed session to discuss, and it's uh, it's, a, it's a document that I feel uh, the public should be aware of. I'm going to try to make my argument. That's mm -hmm. democracy. I'm going to try to make my argument with my 30 colleagues around the table and say, no, no, why are we discussing this? Anymore? And it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's, 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 it's uh, uh, you know, it's best advice from our human resources department. It's best advice from uh, our lawyers, whether it's a land acquisition, whether it's human resources, whether it's a legal issue. We're taking their best advice. And at the end of the day, you have to take the advice of the professionals. And maybe you think it's in the public interest, but if it will impact the outcome in a negative way uh, or even a positive way y you have to respect the confidentiality of that uh, of that of that particular issue well there's a reason rules are in place for sure absolutely yeah. is there anyone named in the bridge report that still has a job at the region oh that's a great question uh, like that again you know, when you talk yeah confidential report oh my leaked god to the media mm -hmm. i happen to get my hands on it right. I, I leaked it out because the media wouldn't well one of them ripped it apart and kind of why do you think that is? Why do you think there hasn't been uh, a whole lot more discussion on that issue? Because you talk about a project that went from fifty-four million to I think the late it's like up to one hundred and ten million now. Because well, it's not sexy like thundering waters or something. God, I don't know. I mean, the you taxpayers think are on the, the hook the, for the, that. The double the budget, especially when Rankin was there, he told them right up front, "Dude, you got issues with stability." I know. And then 
he was barred from speaking to you guys at the region. Now you probably weren't on, yeah. on the board on the no. I see that that, that predates me. They so. told him he would if he got yeah. up and spoke. Uh, the lawyer advised counsel at the mm. time that he'd be considered a lobbyist. Are you kidding me? He had valid information. Well, yeah. Whether or not he was a bit in the bidding process or not had nothing to do with it. He had some serious issues with the stability of the ground and that uh, yeah that sewer intake or whatever it was under the bridge there that ended up being a huge deal too. Yeah. And well, then we got missing steel. I heard about that like, too. Yeah, Andy. Yeah. But you know, yeah. you like him or not, at least he was like, what, "What's going on here?" You know, goes, going into the scrapyard and then where? To the goes states? back to that point, though, right? No, no agency or government that is a recipient of public dollars should be removed from that kind of scrutiny. So you scrutinize it, uh, but at the same token, too, you have to. You have to take an evidence-based approach, right? So you gather all the evidence. You gather all the evidence, and then you formulate your opinions and your, um, uh, you know, your your criticisms based on the evidence. It's only when you don't take in all that evidence and you start shooting your mouth off uh, that that's not necessarily how I would operate. Uh, so give me all the evidence first, and then I'm going to take all that evidence and make an evidence-based decision, one way or the other. Give me an example of uh, something you changed your tune on, something you went into, you thought you had a position, and you went, okay, um, you probably gained some more information or mm -hmm. knowledge on the issue you were talking about, and went, okay, I'm, I'm backpedaling on this one. I'm, I'm flip-flopping, for lack of a better term. Yeah, because yeah. I think, it, you know, we talked about, you know, I refer to it as being red-pilled. I ran 1993. Gibby Parent was yeah. the Speaker of the House in Welland. Yeah. The Niagara Centre was my riding. Yeah. 93. GPC Green Party of Ontario. Mm -hmm. I don't believe the same things. Yeah. And man, the Green Party continues to go left with the Liberals and the NDP, and then you know uh, the the uh, the Conservatives come more to the center to take you yeah. know. And um, so, can you, can you give me an example of something only, you changed your tune on? So probably the only thing I've ever really kind of thought long and hard about are the many. Oh my God, and too many to count. The many many discussions we've had on integrity commissioners and you know in my role as the chair at the npca i mean who's going to be the integrity commissioner or just what do you just have the, one the or whole not? yeah the whole the whole thing and, and the complaints on top yeah of it. because you know you've created this um this this situation where you could actually go uh complaint shopping so I'll, you know I'll, I'll use a quick example and let's use um uh, mayor mayor diodati i love jimmy by the way love him um, you know, he's, they have a, an integrity commissioner. I like Jim too, but it doesn't mean I have to like his politics. No, exactly. You know no, I mean? but, but <laughs> you have the system in place at uh, Niagara Falls and there's an integrity commissioner and there's a process there. Okay. Then you have another one at the region. Okay. Then you have another one at the board of the NPCA. So talk about double, different policies. Yeah. So talk about double jeopardy. Uh, a member of the public can come forward and, and, and file, file three against it, you. Well, they, you know, let's, let's do some complaint shopping here. Didn't go nowhere at. Niagara Falls Council, let's take it to the region now. Or let's take it to the NPCA. And you might have three different three different uh, outcomes. I mean, it's just, it's it's incredible. Um, I know, cannot believe that you can file an integrity complaint with somebody and the integrity commissioner gets it and there's not even a simple thing like notice of registered mail that someone received I the know. fact there's a complaint against you. Now, leave out the fact that they're anonymous. Mm -hmm. That's bullshit. That uh, you sometimes you don't even get to speak to it, forget defend yourself. Yeah. You don't know what the complaint is. You don't get to face the like jurisprudence mm -hmm. is completely thrown out the window. That there's a constitutional issue there. It has to yeah. be the code that it speaks to doesn't respect the charter. It doesn't set limits of for, are you always on the clock? You're. I mean, I you guys, what do you get paid? Eighteen thousand to be at the uh, region, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Now you're going to tell me yeah. that I'm never off the clock. Yeah. And I can't be well, myself around my friends for fear that I'm going to lose I, my job. That oh, you know, re the only reason I'm at the region is because I care. You don't think I'm there for the money. I know. Like, and I mean, and this is the thing too, because I mean, I'm I'm a, I'm a huge stickler for hypocrisy. I'm a huge stickler we're for all hypocrisy. So. We are to some degree, but I'm talking when you talk about policy, okay? The hypocrisy with respect to some of the policies, and I always said this: there's got to be more fidelity in the policies that we've we've crafted and created. What do you mean? Well, let's say, for example, and I'll use your example of being on the clock all the time. Okay, uh, if you look at the code of conduct, you're a counselor. You're a counselor all the time. You're a, all the time. But then you look at the council expense policy, 
And oh, <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Well, I'm just, it's a great segue, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you look at the council. No, 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 no. no you're you're not. Why? Why are you? Why? You can't bill for that. You're you're, you're going to a, you're going to a radio station as a Niagara regional councilor representing the town of Fort Erie to talk about issues of importance. It doesn't matter if they're provincial, federal. I mean, Niagara's not uh, this isolated little bubble. I mean, the same issues affect Niagarans just as they affect anyone else in Ontario. Um, no, 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 no. That's you. No, you're you're not you're not a counselor then. And why would you why would you charge? Why would you charge mileage for that? You're not a counselor then. But you just said I'm a counselor all the time, twenty four seven on the clock. Well, like so, the my point being, yeah. my point being is there's no fidelity, right? There's no oh, okay. left hand knowing what the right hand is doing with respect to pol- it's siloed policy, and we saw that all the time at the, at the province, um, places to grow, uh, green belt, uh, wetland policy. I mean, there's no fidelity to any of it. I mean, Niagara's supposed to. Uh, you know, be this economic gateway, this economic places corridor. Green belt. Yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> Employment well, lands. No, the places to grow yeah. because of, well, we put a green belt on it. All. So exactly. So there's no there's no uh, cohesion yeah. to any of those policies, right? It's just left hand not knowing what the left right hand is doing. It's siloed policy. Uh, it, it 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 collides with each other. And for the longest time, if you're a municipal politician, that's what you go to AMO to talk about over and over and over again, hoping that someone will finally get it at the province. Uh, the bureaucrats will start listening and say, yeah, you know what, you're right. It does impact your ability to grow. It does impact your ability uh, towards economic prosperity. we got to do something about this. Nothing ever gets done. What's uh, your pet uh, passion uh, politically at the region? Um, my pet passion is to finally recognize Niagara as this incredible economic asset not just this municipality that municipality all of niagara and we had its great presentation from the hamilton port authority and it's landlocked. there's no more places to grow for the hamilton port authority so they're slowly moving down to niagara looking at assets and i remember i told the assets general for what? Uh, infrastructure assets transportation assets and i said you know all of niagara all of niagara is a transportation asset you have canal. the canal. You have Real. major series highways. You have the capacity for a, a, a commercial, possibly national or international airport. You do have the acreage for that. Uh, you have four international bridge crossings, one of them being the most busiest mm-hmm. uh, um, transportation corridor link in all of North America. $40 billion a year in commerce passes just over the Peace Bridge. For the longest time, these things just fly over people's radar, and we're not taking advantage of those assets like we should be. Um, so Niagara is Niagara is the gateway into Canada. It's not the end. Mm-hmm. Okay, you don't go to Toronto and then Hamilton, and oh, by the way, we're we're going to make our way to the end of the province in Niagara. No, no, no. Niagara should be the gateway into the province and into Canada, and that's that's the um, that's the language we have to start speaking now so that's what I'm passionate about at uh, and and I'm, 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 I'm fortunate that way because Fort Erie is the first stop it's the mm-hmm. first stop on that uh, that transportation Fort come corridor. A long way, man. oh my god you know I'm I am so proud to be born and raised in that community and uh, finally I think uh, uh, the rest of our partners in the region the province uh, even the federal government are recognizing Fort Erie for what it is and it's an incredible place to raise a family and it's it has incredible opportunity right now and those assets have never been fully realized for close to 30 years now so that's the conversation I want to have and that's what I've been having at the region for the past four years man I wish the media would focus a little bit on that I know uh, I'm kind of repeating myself I talked to Dave Barrick the other day I know the media will say we'll stop doing stupid things and we'll stop (laughs) reporting on it but there is a way of reporting you know objectively and not yeah. like i kind of feel like there's a well castle's the new target now petrowski mm-hmm. has been for a long time and yeah. it seems like the lefties seem to get a free pass or they get, seem to get um it seems like positive coverage mm-hmm. and i know that you know a great majority of the media is kind of left-leaning yeah. and you know we, before we went on air i think you made yeah. a great point it's like what would you say about when you're 20 or oh 24? yeah if yeah, you're so not say, voting left, if you're not letting, if you you're not voting left, you don't have a heart. <laughs> and uh, you know, you get into your thirties and you start seeing how much they're taking off your paychecks and all those kind of things. And if yeah. you're not voting right, you, you don't have a, a brain. More yeah. conservative, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, if, uh, you know, uh, we talk about the assets of the community, um, and that's you know, I was on Walter for a long time when he was head of the GNCC, yeah. 
first of all, I mean, even just making it the GNCC was kind of ridiculous as far because he didn't take any with him with him yeah it's not the greater nag or anything it's the yeah. st captain's thorold still yeah but that's out of here you know that's long dead and i'm gonna beat that to death still right now but um i was always on him about you know the system's broken we're falling behind but like this false mm -hmm. narrative because it's not true yeah the quality of life great real estate prices yep. nobody was ever talking about the real estate prices now we're on the map now yeah. people from toronto barry and even further i mean i'm in the game so i see it yeah people are coming in going what's up with your taxes down here dude yeah. my house is worth 1.2 million dollars in toronto i pay less taxes than you do here look at this house it's 369 yeah. Yeah. so that's a shocker telecommunication hub you know yeah the business community knows we sit on a big fat trunk of fast moving data yep no, you know most people don't know that mm -hmm. most people don't know that one of our greatest natural resources is our musicians yeah we've got such a deep talent know, and pool you're in this. huge you're a huge promoter well, of that I just, too yeah I and i kind of stumbled across it when i was on 610 you know i kind of fell into the you know i met someone i'm like hey maybe we could do bumper music live somebody went yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. And then I just kept doing it yeah. like every week. And, and now it's turned into, you know, I have the resources now, uh, you know, doing this in my little padded room, by the way. Well, how great is Sessions, though? How great is that oh, spot? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, my great. God. I but love that spot. But he's got his issues over there, too. I know. He's trying to make it work. And trying to make it work, I know. I mean, oh, you're way out there in Fort Erie. Yeah. Well, you know what? When I was standing at the base of the Peace Bridge doing my little, yeah. I did a few gigs out there. yeah. yeah. It was so beautiful. You walk out the front door. There's the river, right? It's oh, incredible. It's great incredible. Segue. Yeah. Talk to me about the designation of the Niagara River. What happened there, man? And you can't say. Oh, Ramsar? Yeah. Don't oh, yeah, tell absolutely. me all oh, it's the bad communications because, hey, we're clear. Okay. You suffer from a communication issue, both at the NPCA, mm. the chair's office, and at the region. No, 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 no. It's, it's so, <laughs> so first off, I take exception to uh, um, Robson's comments that, and it's almost as if he's parroting, parroting you know, that, that narrative, well, the NPCA's pro-development. I don't know how that pro-development has anything to do with a Ramsar designation, number one, okay? So um, that was an unfortunate comment that he made. The second point I want to make is the board fully supported Ramsar. And if you look at the motion we crafted when we supported Ramsar was, listen, all we want to do is keep our stakeholders and our partners informed as far as Ramsar goes. So part of the motion was to make sure that there was uh, NPCA board members liaisoning and involved in the decision making, bringing back information to our community partners. And crickets, Jim, we didn't get anything. So we would send off communique uh, to the American uh, chair and the Canadian chair. Still nothing. We got nothing. Um, but, you know, that's, that's water under the bridge. Uh, uh, for a Ramsar designation to take place, you need a tri-party commitment from the municipalities that are most affected by it, which would be Fort Erie, Niagara Falls, and Niagara-on-the-Lake. And um, Niagara-on-the-Lake has never committed to it because the agricultural sector has just never been fully assured that this isn't a Trojan horse uh, and somehow this is going to be another level of bureaucracy and legislation and regulation on some of the things that they do as agriculturalists and farmers and they've never signed on to it and maybe if they did a better job of communicating every step of the way the NPCA probably would have been at the table with them to help communicate uh, that message but to this point we've never uh, gotten any information from uh, that that binational committee um, and we've asked for it so um, you know that's the story on Ramsar um, we just want to make informed, thoughtful decisions. And when you don't get the information you need to make those informed, thoughtful decisions, unfortunately, it's very difficult to, to, to buy in and, and give your support a thousand percent on it. How do you speak to the turnover at the MPCA and the packages that paid out when the allegations or maybe the narrative created is you got rid of the people that wanted to conserve and you yeah. got rid of the and people that And that's the narrative exactly, stopping, right? Uh, yeah. You know, business development or something like Jim, that. I wasn't kidding. 2013, if you look at uh, uh, some of the accounting, it's like handwritten notes, like handwritten notes. That's how they did accounting. Um, there was no HR policy. There, they, th that organization was an organization in crisis, and I give a lot of credit to the board of the day. Um, it was chaired by Bart Maves, uh, and uh, uh, that board recognized that we're listening to the community voices, and everyone seems to have a problem with the NPCA, whether you're a farmer, 
whether you're in the development community, whether you're an environmentalist, everyone seems to have a bone to pick with the NPCA. Why is that? So they went to those public stakeholder meetings. They hired the independent consultant to draft uh, the strategic plan moving forward. And they identified a whole bunch of issues. An organization in crisis. And that, that, those aren't my words. That's the words of the independent consultant. This is an organization in crisis. Mm. Uh, you are an organization uh, in an FD you know, as far as grading goes, yep. um, and you got to make changes. So you make those changes, and part of that change management, part of that change culture, yeah, it had a lot to do with uh, uh, with some of the employees there, some of the staff. There's some turnover in staff, people moving on to bigger and better things. Uh, but uh, craft this narrative that you know there's this purge of uh, conservationists and environmentalists. Uh, not true. Uh, we respect our mandate. We value our mandate. If you look at the staff we have right now, incredible, incredible staff that are very mindful of what their obligations are to their craft, uh, to their um, to their designations as ecologists, biologists, planners, and they respect the language of the Conservation Authorities Act and they follow it. And this whole misconception that somehow the board, the board is involved in planning decisions, absolutely ridiculous absolutely ridiculous it's just misconceptions and false narratives and why you got so many councils jumping on the bandwagon here to replace the whole board like just uh, just tear it apart and start over and i talked to barrick uh dave i should call him barrick i don't know him well enough to say that but well, whatever he's not gonna send me a hate-filled text message dave, i'm sure Dave's pretty good that way um you know i talk about um oh, i lost my train of thought where we're going as far as councils passing resolutions oh, to oh yeah um <laughs> like what do you think that you know they're well, jumping on the bandwagon of, of yeah. false narratives i mean poor colburn's the latest one. Oh, I, I, that's I, where i was going i was talking to dave about you know just yeah dissolve the region because it's to me it's corrupt from a standpoint that it just can't you can't reform that type yeah. of, because you got guys carving up 10 kilometer roads into one kilometer pieces to give the contracts to his friends we got this bridge deal someone got paid yeah. off in the bridge deal come on yeah so you, you know so like, you know what yeah you're talking about like somebody his, got some yeah. steel you're and... talking about some historical elements that kind of predate my time right but all i can say um and you know i, I try to reassure as many people as possible we talk about managing expectations so someone comes to you and says hey this person is corrupt that person is corrupt this person is corrupt and you got to sit them down and say listen I'm, I'm 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 there and if there's anything like that i'm gonna i'm gonna look into it i'm gonna uh, make sure that those those allegations are unfounded and for the most part they are um, I think we're doing a lot of good so things at the region right a, now. You're not a guy that's going to sweep something under the rug theorist, you know. and just bury it. No, say, not ah, at all. Away, not at all. I, 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 I open up the show saying, absolutely, any organization, any public organization, any, any elected official, anyone that is the recipient of public dollars should willingly accept scrutiny and, and public criticism. Um, it has to be evidence-based, though. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think uh, the natural, uh, you know, the natural thing to say and do is just to say all politicians are corrupt, all politicians uh, are on the take. There's graft, and there's, you, you know what I mean. It's that's just a natural thing to say. Um, but like I said, I sleep very good at night. I know I'm trying to do the best that I can for uh, first and foremost the people that put me at the region, and for the region as a whole. And I think we're doing some great things. And just look at the evidence. And whatever whatever metrics you want to decide as far as our indicators, whether or not we're doing a good job or not, I mean, I look at the job growth. I look at uh, economic prosperity. Um, from a conservation perspective, I look at our tree canopy. I, I look at um, our ability to make sure that uh, people are uh, enjoying um, areas of nature and our conservation parks. Um, I mean, these are, these are metrics I use because it all comes down to health and well-being of my family, my kids. And as long as I'm doing a great job uh, ensuring that legacy, mm -hmm. then uh, I can sleep very good at night. Cool. Uh, and I've been making fun of you about your trips to uh, 1010 and bill in the region for it. Well, every, any chance. Which says that yeah. I build the region. I want to hey, do, I I hate I you for yeah. it. I want to hate you for expensing that shit, but then I look and I'm Kilometers, going, yeah, I, I Why? did. Why? No, I think it's a great deal. 
I think it's a great hey, listen, this, this, do you this, know how much expense? Do you oh. know how much ads are? You know how much ads are. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, and uh, Jerry's great. half minute down here. At Jerry's six, great because he actually gives me time. Anymore. He gives me time and energy and platform to talk about things that are and going on in Niagara. he introduces you as a regional politician every time? About 10 times a show. And then you got all the lead in and all the teasers. Absolutely. And say, Everything. Who, who is it that you're on with? Oh, I'm on with uh, uh, no, the host, the show host. Oh, Jerry Agar. Jerry Agar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear him saying, yeah. you know, on the show and Sandy and Nancy, there's all kinds Absolutely. of promos that run I know. all week on that stuff. I know, and uh, that's one thing I've learned uh, about being in the media and being in broadcasting is that consistent message over and over what and over it, again. Four thousand bucks or something. Oh my God, if that, I don't even know what it was like. Four grand, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But but to that point. So if you look at where we come from, from an economic development perspective, there's only two paths you can take when it comes to economic development. Number one, retention. Mm. And number two, attraction. So retention, your voice stays within, within the walls of Niagara, mm. uh, seeing what you can do to help small business, seeing what you can do to help manufacturers in the industrial sector. What can we do to make life better for you to stay here? Because I know you want to up and leave because the cost of hydro is cost prohibitive. Labor uh, is cost prohibitive. I know you want to leave this jurisdiction for a more friendlier jurisdiction in North Carolina or somewhere else. I know you want to. So that's the first role of economic development is how do we keep you here? How do we keep you happy? That's the first premise. The second premise is attraction. How do we expose Niagara? How do we expose Niagara to some of the great assets that we have here? How do we do that? Well, we have to talk about Niagara outside of those borders. And there's no coincidence. Look at the state of uh, the region address. You invited Water, Kitchener Waterloo and you invited Hamilton to talk about what we can do as, a, as this, uh, this, this, this collaborative to make sure that we're, we're, we're meeting the expectations of our residents. And it's the same thing with Niagara. We've got to start talking outside our borders. We've got to start talking to Toronto. We've got to start talking to Ottawa, Hamilton, Kitchener Waterloo, because that's where. Uh, we want to attract some of that talent to come to Niagara. And you only do that by talking about Niagara outside of Niagara. So uh, I'm fully committed to that. I'm one of those very fortunate politicians that actually has that platform. And you enjoy it. You're and I enjoy it. And I'm going to keep doing it because uh, uh, no matter what you want to say about uh, the $4,000 or $5,000, whatever uh, um, you know the expense was with respect to my kilometers, I'm telling you, uh, it, it's worth it to have that conversation uh, I could pick up the phone and talk to uh, Mayor Tory. I can pick up the phone and talk to colleagues from uh, different uh, regional municipal councils and say, Good "Listen, uh, you know, we have a we have a casino issue that we really need help with." And I know you have a direct pipeline uh, to Queens Park and some of the decision makers there. And let's face it, some people at Queens Park don't even know we exist. So you're damn right I'm going to keep t talking that message of Niagara <laughs> in downtown Toronto so they can hear me every day talk about Niagara. And you can talk about Jerry, talk about Niagara and all the great things that we're doing. Carolyn Iannone gets in. And Carolyn, um, come on the show. Return my call. She's dead. What is it with these people? They're all hot. Yell, come on, yell, come on. And yeah. then crickets, they're gone forever. You would have thought they're high-priced outside legal would have known the NPCA could not sue a private citizen. Um, we touched on that last Yeah, time. yeah. No, but again, though, so, so this is the difference we have to make, though, okay? So the case was never heard, okay? So um, there was a, a, a case brought forward to correct those, those, uh, those most damning comments, those three, those three issues um, uh, uh, Mr. D'Angelo had and the MPCA had. That case was never heard because before that case could be heard, uh, the other side put forward... Um, uh, uh, um, a case to have it dismissed on slap grounds. So that's what was heard. And based on the commentary in the slap suit, that's what was agreed upon. Ramsey so ruled on the basis of exactly. the so, so the whole idea... But isn't it a slap suit? Aren't you... Uh, you, can, you can couch it in I would know. misrepresentation I, or defamatory comments. You but could, but... but basically, but, we're saying shut the fuck up and go away, Ed Smith. No, you know, I don't, I don't think we ass. said that because well, I said, I mean, you know, with the lawsuit, that's, you know, I'm not saying you said that, but, you know, that's the attitude that most, I mean, yeah. and I am generalizing, not most, some, maybe the loudest voices, maybe the people that are screaming loudest about the Petrowskis and the NPCAs and the Sandy yeah. Annunziatas and the Bruce Timses or the Dave Barracks are the, are the very fringe of yeah. the extremes and are, are the minority because if it was the majority, you'd hear a lot more of it, the, you know, the, yeah. the, people that are in the fat part of the bell curve probably aren't saying yeah. jack 
It's it's probably the most pissed off and the most extreme that maybe have the loudest voice is just like Trump and Antifa, you know? So I will say this, though, okay? As you as a private citizen, and uh, Carmen D'Angelo is a, is a private citizen. I mean, he, he, he was a public servant, but he, he wasn't an elected official. I got thick skin. You want to call me corrupt and, you know, t- tell me I'm on the take and all those kind of things. You know, I accept the criticism. I take it with a grain of salt. Okay, whatever. Um, but if someone attacked you and... As a staffer. As, 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 thing, as yeah. a staffer, and they said, and it compromised you your integrity and your reputation and it may have impacted your ability to gain to you know to to secure gainful employment and to uh, advance your career and uh, you were labeled as this corrupt individual that was doing illegal and immoral and irresponsible things I would think you Jim Fannin as a private citizen would do everything that you can to make sure that that individual is held to account by what he said Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't see any difference here Yes, the MPCA was a joint partner in that because there was some defamatory things said about the organization as a whole. But if I'm Carmen D'Angelo, absolutely, I'm going to try to regain you can't my reputation. Defame an organization, though. you can defame an individual. You can slander an individual. I can, I got to defame, yeah. you know, board yeah. of directors. Yeah, and that's that's what Judge Rule, uh, Ramsey ruled on, right? He says, listen, you're a public organization. Uh, take it and then move on. And you know that's his ruling, and and when we did that, and, and we're moving on from that, but. Um, I can't speak for Carmen and uh, um, his motivation, but I know from my personal perspective, if someone wanted to attack me as a private citizen and said a whole bunch of things about me that just weren't mm-hmm. true, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I, I'm going to demand the, the retraction and the apology. Did you know in Canada you can success you can be successfully sued for libel for telling the truth? I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the wow. few so-called democracies. Yeah. And it's happened. I was uh, pretty close to one of the things that went down. Uh, we talked about you flip-flopping and having a change of heart on an issue. Do you have any regrets, anything you'd take back at any level of government that any, I mean, not personally, we've all got that, but uh, hmm, that's yeah, a anything question. you can say, yeah, maybe we didn't handle that so well. I mean, we talked about the yeah. the, the abysmal communication, maybe the strategy is good, but it has not played out well on the field, uh, both at the region, the chair's office, with yeah. the media with uh, any of it. I mean, it's just gone badly. And well, I don't want to yeah. generalize, but it's What's that old saying? Never go to war with someone that uh, buys ink by the barrel? <laughs> uh, Is that the one? If you don't want to lose the game, yeah. don't play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, because I'd like to think that the decisions I make, I'm telling you, our packages come, uh, our agendas come, and you have to do your homework, and you have to kind of read between the lines a little bit, take everything, uh, don't take anything at face value if you're an elected official, go to staff, ask the questions that you need to ask and be prepared. Before you hit that button, yes or no, make sure you know what you're voting for. Um, And then have the courage, because if more information comes to light after that vote, have the courage to say, whoa, 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 I didn't have that piece of information when I cast my vote. I want to revisit that. And some call you a uh, flip-flopper. Some call you uh, not a person of your convictions. No, no, no. You being know, open-minded. You, yeah, you're being open-minded. And you can't be so rigid uh, that you're not willing to, you know, absorb more facts and more data on that issue. And it happens all the time, right? Um, for example, something that gets passed at the committee level, uh, once it gets to council as a whole, you have another kick at the can, another opportunity to lift that item and... If there's new information, put it on the table and then see if your colleagues uh, are, are, are willing to accept the new information, the new, the, the, the new facts that came forward. That's democracy in action. Uh, but we have a governance model, right? And we have rules of procedure that would allow that. So nothing uh, is heavy handed. Uh, you follow the rules of procedure. Uh, you, you provide respectful uh, discourse amongst your colleagues. And hopefully you come up with the right decision at the end of the day. What do you say to a guy like me that's – I can't look away? You know, I, I've, I've got a political Yeah, it's in your problem. blood. Oh, it's yeah, in your I blood, got, man. i got a huge problem. And, you know, I know my my critics will say, well, and have said, you just do it for the – to get your name in the paper. Dude, I've been a realtor for tw- over 25 yeah. years. I get my name in the paper every weekend yeah. if I want to do an open house. It's, it's yeah. not about having your picture in the paper. It's not about – Making a noise, you know. I ran for mayor because I really wanted to keep Walter out. That's no secret. Yeah. yeah. Jeff was my guy. I thought I could make a difference. Sure. Well, it didn't go so well. Yeah. I was, you know, it hurt. Yeah. But I'm over it, and I'm not going to hate the guy forever because he won. Mm-hmm. He did the right thing. The first thing you got to be able to do as a politician yeah. is get elected. 
But what do you say to a guy like me yeah. that's always run Green Party? Yeah. That's never run ever with the purpose of winning, you know, and I think, you know, there's there's some value in that. Maybe, you know, you teach somebody what, what, what proportional representation is, is that, you know, majority governments shouldn't have 37% of the popular support. Mm-hmm. But now I got municipals coming up, and the only place I can look is that region. Yeah. What do you say to a guy like me that should be out selling some houses, making some money? Yeah. Not get because I I take this shit serious. Yeah, I, I would know you do. Read every report. I know you do. I would go to every committee meeting. Mm-hmm. I'd be on time. I'd be dressed well. I'd be standing up yeah. and t- talking to them about what I believe in, not just to hear my own voice, but because I love this community I and know. I want to make it a better place. But you know what? Sometimes I look around. I'm like, fuck this place with all the corruption, perceived corruption, yeah. with all the cronyism or favoritism or nepotism or whatever you want to call it yeah, i am out of here man that's just... that's the great thing about living in canada is the democratic process um allows you to have a voice and allows you to cultivate uh people that share your voice and your opinion and i'll give you a great example this whole idea of sanitized politicians it upsets me i want to know what you stand for um, and it's funny when a politician comes out and they stand on principle or they say, say something that maybe uh, uh, offends someone else, you know, immediately someone calls for the leader of that particular uh, organization or that particular party to censor that person, to kick them off, uh, to don't allow them to run. Uh, why would you want someone like that in, in government? I, I, I dismiss that outright. I'd rather know where a politician stands. So when I do cast my ballot, if I share those opinions with them, mm-hmm. then maybe I'll vote for them. If I don't share those opinions, I'm not voting for them. I would say the repudiation of where a politician stands on issues comes at the ballot box. Four years with Western, 89 to 92. Yeah. Member of the Vanya Cup winning team. National championship, yeah. Did and they just won another McConnell? one last year. Did you play with McConnell or no? Yeah, I play with Sandy. See, uh, yeah, Tommy. Oh, Tommy, Tommy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. guys are the same age group. Tommy was, I think, uh, two or three years younger. Oh, Older? younger than me. Younger than me. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I was there my maybe last year, and Tommy was just two great cups. Two great cups. Your ring? Oh, they're you so big and bulky. I don't even wear them. Yeah. <laughs> two with Toronto or no one with Toronto, one with, one with, Toronto, Edmonton. One with Edmonton. Yeah. Yeah. Blue Bombers, you played with? Are you with... drafted by the Blue Bombers? No, I was drafted by uh, Calgary. And then um, I went to a uh, training oh, okay. camp there, and okay. uh, they said San- it was Wally Bono. I remember he goes, "Sandy, 166 goes, games." Yeah, you got CTE. <laughs> I hope you not. Done football. Hey, player. you know what? It's <laughs> funny though because we talk about that all the time, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to make light of CTE. No, I know, I know, and that's yeah, Brutal, because man. I got a lot of you friends of mine. I worry about it. Yeah, I worry about it, and I'll tell you who worries about it more. I remember my wife; uh, um, she read an article in the Globe and Mail one day. And uh, the headline was um, life expectancy of uh, football players pegged at 55. Mm. Yeah. But if you read further in the body of the story, uh, they actually put it close to 50. And um, yeah, that was that's pretty upsetting. That's pretty upsetting for for the family of a football player. Right. Uh, I was an offensive lineman for 11 years. Yeah. And that's a long time to play. Because they say the average career expectancy is three years of a football player. I played eleven. Yeah, so well, you're in good shape. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, so no, knock on wood, no issues so far. But I look at some of my friends and colleagues that played the game, and uh, God bless them. Um, you know, some of them are struggling right now with uh, with with some of those issues, and all you have to do is be there for them, right? Mm. But if you look back and you say, do you have any regrets? I don't have any regrets. You know, I, I went into uh, professional football with eyes wide open. I knew exactly what I was signing up for. I knew what I was getting myself involved with. And uh, uh, two great cups later, incredible friendships, incredible relationships. I got no regrets. Who are you picking up? The kids. Oh, picking up the kids. Yeah. Picking up. Uh, picking up Max, uh, who uh, who will be thirteen uh, soon. And chip uh, off the old block. Yeah, uh, chip off the old block. And the twins, uh, Roman and uh, and Gianna. Uh, um, so we're picking those up, uh, picking the kids up at three, and then we're kind of spending some family time together, grabbing a bite to eat, and then I got to get to regional council. I got you out of here at two fifteen on the button, brother. Thanks, brother. Appreciate, I appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Hey, my pleasure. Uh, we'll come back in. Dave Augustine's on next week, uh, Wednesday, three o'clock, I think. 
Uh, I'll get that out on some social media. We'll upload this to YouTube later on. Thanks to all the... Yeah, we're still going live on Facebook. Thanks, everyone. Uh, oh. Oh, yeah, we got some comments. You can read them later. I want to get you out of here on time. <laughs> no We're worries. not important. Okay, so appreciate it, Sandy. Uh, look for us later on. No worries.